Here we go, episode 128 of the Trash Talk Business Podcast. This is our weekly opportunity to get together and share best practices so we can grow, build, devour our junk removal dream. That's right. We are here in the recycling, the removal, the demolition, deconstruction space where we are all building that dream on how to serve customers, keep things out of the landfill, and make the world go round. As always, I'm your host, Andy Wines, and this week we have a very special guest. On very short notice, like minutes, if not hours, Chris Weir with Spartan Junk Removal. Chris, welcome to the program. Thank you for having me on. So, why are you here? We'll just, you know, I'm going to drink coffee, you're going to talk, that's how we do this podcast. Why are you here today? Sure. Um... So, yeah, uh, we have a mutual uh, acquaintance, um, Andrew Barton with the Barton Bros uh, mm. uh, up in New Jersey. And um, y'all needed a guest. And he was like, hey, Chris, jump on this right now. And uh, <laughs> that led me to you guys today. Uh, Andy and I talk quite a bit. Here we go. See, this is, again, I, I, I love the fact that I tell people, hey, there's nothing behind the scenes. There's no, This is the conversation. Um, and, and I, yeah, I met you all of four minutes ago and that's a stretch, but closer to two. So I came in after my last show, made me a cup of coffee and here we are. All right. So, you know, Andy Barton, where are Spartan junk removal? You got a lion with a, uh, what is that thing called? What is that? Like the, the floofy thing on the top of the Trojan's helmet. I don't even know what that thing's called. You yeah. Know what called? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Well, uh, for us, um, that's Leonidas in the background, and he has his his oh, mohawk, yeah. this Spartan mohawk that he has going on. Okay. Uh, Look, at, you already got a shout out. You got a shout out from Eddie. Uh, Spartan Jungle has cool brand and clean Facebook ads. We run our service in Northern Virginia. All right, where where are you also in Northern Virginia then, Chris? Where are you guys at? Uh, I'm actually in Laurel, Maryland, so I'm not too far okay. away from Northern Virginia. Maryland's a pretty small state. Uh, but yeah, it's also we, the weirdest. It's also, let's, let's be honest. Let's not even fucking kid ourselves. Maryland is the weirdest shaped state ever. Like it, nothing about Maryland makes sense. Like you got to have the coastline that makes sense. And then you just have this, this isthmus between Virginia and Pennsylvania that makes no sense. Weirdest, weirdest <laughs> shaped state by far. So I actually know why it has such a weird, uh, shape, uh, way back in the day. Um, English. there was, a yeah, it was well, it was border dispute between uh, Maryland and Pennsylvania, and they were like, "Hey, we'll just agree to whatever the surveyors did," and they screwed up on their little tools, and it cut out quite a few miles of Maryland. <laughs> yeah, because there's one spot. What like it's like twenty miles wide, or I mean, it's yeah. like I mean, it is. It, yeah, it, it, it's really thin. Well, that's also like that that circle between Delaware and New Jersey, because it's like a six mile radius or whatever it is from a random point. The English fucked everything up. Um, yeah, pretty <laughs> yeah, you know what? That's the only straight border. I suppose your western boundary is also a straight border because your southern border, eastern border are not straight. Uh, Hawaii. Hawaii is the only state in the in the union without a straight border. Also, yeah. because it's an island. Yeah. Every other every other state has a straight line somewhere, like the bottom of Wisconsin, top of Illinois. That's a, that's both of our straight lines because everything else is rivers or, or lakes. After that, so anyways. Uh, yeah. Maryland, random straight border dividing you between uh, the Virginias and Pennsylvania. Totally jacked up. Um, exactly. What a weird little state that is. Okay, so you're there. You're there in Maryland. So the, the, the guy there, Eddie. Eddie knows you from the Northern Virginia. So do you run into Virginia then, where you're at? Um, it's, it's rare. Uh, oh, ads, yeah. yeah. Uh, probably just because of the way that yeah, uh, yeah. you know the systems run and and stuff yeah. like that. Um, but we'll go to Northern Virginia every once in a while. Um, a lot of times we shift. We have a couple companies um, that we work with around the area. So if if the jobs are too far eastbound or jobs are too far west, uh, we work with. So uh, we have a couple um, really great companies around the area. No, I love that. You know, whenever I see guys in the drunken little space that operate in similar AOs or nearby or next door neighbors, I love that. I love because this is this is the uh, growth minded um, abundance mindset of our industry. It's like, hey, if there's someone that's closer that can do it as well or better. Like, yeah, send them the work. Like, aim small, miss small. Stick with what you do and you do best. All right. So you said you talk to Andy Barton on a regular. So you're you're a fan mm -hmm. of the Bar the Barton Bros. Um, how, talk, let's talk about your business. How big's your business? How long you been in? How long you been in business? 
why are, why'd you get into business? All those things. That's all the stuff that's interesting. Because I don't know you from anybody. I've never even seen your name pop up in a Facebook group. Sure. I, I know you're, you're this is the least prepared I've ever been for an interview. And, and really not much different than most interviews. The guy two weeks ago was like, I don't even know who you are. Random guy that's going to yeah. talk about marketing. <laughs> yeah. Um, so great. So I, I started in the industry about 12 years ago. Um, uh, we do a lot of work around the central Maryland area. Um, uh, we're hovering about a million in sales per year, uh, oh, which is uh, really good, exhausting, but, but, but pretty good. Um, we, um, uh, I started in the industry. I actually used to work for, uh, two of the larger, uh, junk removal companies. Um, but I ended up going to school. I have a law degree, uh, of all things, uh, pre-law degree. I didn't get my, uh, Juris doctorate. Uh, but during the time that I was going to school, I needed a job to, uh, to help pay my bills. So I was like, Hey, I already know the junk removal industry. Like that's what I need to do. Um, so yeah. I opened up the company, paid myself through college, and I ended up um, doing really well at it. So, uh, you know, we've been around for, for quite a few years, 12 years officially, but I've been yeah. kind of working on and off uh, for about 15 years. So we've had a lot of good time to uh, build up some customers and uh, get a really good reputation around the area. Um, and it's just like you said, we actually have a really good reputation with our competition as well. Um, so... Uh, you know, we are a smaller base company. We can handle a lot of things, but uh, while we haven't had it yet, but um, we were working in collaboration with a, uh, a company to our north. Um, we had, a, I think it was like a 250 truckload job and they needed it done faster than we could turn it out. Uh, yeah. So we reached out to a couple people we knew. Um, we were going to collaborate on that, but then it ended up uh, uh, going away. They ended up doing a, a different route on it. Um, uh, but nonetheless, that's kind of where my story started and, uh, that's where we are today. So why junk removal? Why'd you get in the first place? Why do you stay in? Sure. Um, so, uh, junk removal, I started off in about, uh, 2003 when I just got out of high school and it was meant to just be a summertime job, um, with big blue out there. Yep. Uh, and then from there, um, my personality, you know, junk removal is transitionary from nature, from the top to the bottom. And and that's what keeps my interest. Um, I, I like the change. I like when things are dynamic. Uh, I love the challenges that are, um, that are here. And I also love the fact that when we have new people come aboard, um, a lot of times we hire, you know, younger people between the ages of 18 and 25. That's just the way that our nature is going because people are just getting out of high school and they're going to college. And uh, I, I love being able to be that good structure where they have a good experience for work. Um, you know, we've had a lot of people come through our doors that are now doctors, they're managers at Microsoft, uh, and they really attribute a lot of their success um, originally being with us because, you know, you see a wide range of, of emotion here. You know, our customers can be going through family members passing. They could be moving, going through divorce, children leaving, um, or it could be joyous. Like they're getting a new couch or they're getting ready to renovate their, uh, their rooms or their basement or whatever. Um, so uh, a lot of our team members can experience all of that wide range and being in more of an intimate uh, for lack of a better word, but, you know, people are inviting us in their house. So, uh, we get to see firsthand of, you know, what they have going on. Um, we get to see first range what their, their emotions are with it. And there's just a lot of benefit to this job and it's always kept my attention. No, I, what you said is I, I talked to Dr. Knight last week or the week before that. And I touched this, I touched on this a couple of weeks ago. I was um, doing a five minute presentation at a, a morning breakfast and most people go up there and they're like, hi, my name's Andy. We do you know, junk removal and this is how we charge and this is our service area. And, you know, these are the things we take and what are your questions? You know? And I walked up and I, I just, I spoke from the heart, you know, my, my origin story goes back to when I was a kid driving around with my dad and then 2009 hit the recession and I started humping loads and pick up appliances. Blah, blah, blah. And I got to a point though, where I said, we're one of the few professions that get to go into people's houses, right? Because most people, they work in offices, they, they work in retail, they work in manufacturing. Like they never actually go into their customers' houses, so we can go to their houses 
The other thing we get to do is we get to touch the possessions because most of the people that go in the house, carpenters, electricians, HVAC guys, plumbers, they're talking, they're, they're, they're working on the physical space, the house. Well, everyone mm -hmm. will say the stuff within the house makes it a home. Well, we get to touch the stuff, right? Us movers, cleaners, reorganizers, like decorators. I mean, that's about, I mean, kind of, that's it, right? We are a niche group of people that get to interact with the stuff that people cherish, the stuff that people sit on, the, pe the stuff that people lived with and, and hung on their walls and brought them joy. So there's that piece. And the other thing I liked what you said is very true is in our, and the younger, younger men, especially, um, we give them perspective, right? Hey, this is how other people live, right? You got a really nasty house. I got guys who are like, fuck, I'm never going to put a piece of trash on the ground ever again because I don't want it to turn into that, right? And then you go in a bomb-ass house and you're like, wow. It's like, well, what does that guy do for a living? It's like, well, a guy or a girl, it's like, well, they were professional. They handled their business. They paid their bills. Like, listen to what they have to say. Like I guess the, 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 the third piece of what you talked about is uh, the organized chaos. Right? That's that's what I love about junk removal. It's like, we, and this is my military background kicking in. It's like, we show up every day, right? We got the time, the place, the uniform. We get on our trucks. We got our jobber governing the things that we're doing. We have this plan. And then as soon as you walk into the first house, it, it's game on. Here's some new stimuluses, right? Like I worked at a gas station years ago and it's like, there's only so many variables in a gas station. You know what I mean? It's like, it's the same four walls. It's the same food. It's about the same customers, right? You go to people's houses, Hell, from job to job, you could have two very completely different experiences, and that's what keeps it. Um, that's what keeps it interesting for me. Uh, before I forget, I'll just jump in real quick. Got plug uh, next week. No, two weekends. Two weekends from today. Two weekends from th this last weekend. Less than two weeks away. Uh, the twenty fifth, twenty sixth of October, we're doing a recycling summit here in Wisconsin, free of charge. Come out. What sparked it was this idea that, you know, it's our warehouse and it's the same thing every day. This is how we run our trucks. This is how we run job. This is how we do this. This is how we do that. Uh, come see how we do things here at Camel Crew Junk Removal so that you can take those best practices back to your place of business. We'll become an operations warehouse networking, throw a fish fry in there. Beautiful time. Starts at noon on the 25th. Uh, two day, day and a half summit, noon to whatever on the 25th. And on the 26th, we're going eight to four. Um, fully immersed junk removal. I'm going to teach you everything. I know in those uh, eight hours on Saturday. So there we go. Now my <laughs> plug is done. Now you can go back to talking. Oh, um, you know, uh, that's really important uh, for a lot of junk removal companies out there to realize, you know, people are inviting us into their house. Um, you know, there has to be a little bit of compassion training with our team mm -hmm. members. You know, uh, that nasty couch that was, um, that were taken out of one of our customers houses and, um, you know, that could be the, the couch that the guy went to college with and met his wife and his favorite cat died on that thing, had some weird infection and died. That's a real story. And that couch was terrible, uh, <laughs> but he had a reaction to it. And I was like, in my mind, I was like, this couch came from the seventies. It smells like, it does smell like cat death. Like this is terrible. Yeah. And here we're removing everything. But uh, I remember my my team member being like, you know, why were you so careful with that thing? You should have just thrown that thing in the truck. It is more of an emotional thing for our customers. Like we are emotional relief. And this is something that I really pound on on each one of my team members when they get here. We are also one of the few industries that do an immediate good for our customers. And that good lasts significantly longer sometimes forever mm -hmm. so wherever you're at when you clean that stuff off uh you know my grandmother when she was alive um uh you know definitely my most favorite person in the world outside of my wife and my kids uh, so, that's a good save uh, good save no yeah. my same my grandma my grandma on my yep. mom my dad's side is my number one person yep yep and um you know uh she was starting to hoard because you know my mom passed away and and it just mm. something clicked i actually saw where she went from not being a hoarder to being a hoarder and it was that loss you know she lost her husband she lost her son she lost her daughter mm. uh and i remember cleaning out that house and like even though she was starting to get a little bit of um a dementia at the time her health improved and it improved for years after that just by clearing everything out and um, I remember, you know, it took me about a year to clean it out because it's not like somebody else's house. I actually had to work with her to get that stuff out. But you're doing an immediate good. You're doing a long-term good. And you're helping people improve their health. 
our job and our business at what we do is inherently a good business that we're in for people. Um, and people should should value that. Even if they don't, uh, we can value that for them. But you know what? I, 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 this is 128 episodes of this show. And I am often, I catch myself um, saying, I've heard it all. I know how to describe this industry. I can talk about it, right? You And, and what you're saying, it's like I've thought it. The way you said it, though, we're doing an immediate good, right? It's not like, oh, you're buying a thing and then over time it's going to pay fruition or, you know, it's going to be great. Like, good that, right, like, right. If you go to a restaurant and you serve a really nice meal, it's like, okay, good meal. And then what happens? You remember that meal until your next meal. Like, that's it. Like, you're going to eat again. So it, it, you're right. It, it is this immediate good. It's tangible. I know that's what I love about it. It's tangible. And I love what you're saying, though. It has long-term effects. So it's not only that immediate good, but it's also it's a, a, a level of permanence to the good that we do. And and you're absolutely right. There, there, is, there is study after study after study um, done with people. Right. When I think about hoarding, it's, you know, cluttering your, your, your head, cluttering your heart, cluttering your right mind, body, soul, and then your physical space. Right. When you remove clutter from your life, whatever it may be, it allows the rest of your life to flourish. Right. So, yes, there's the obvious there's crap in your house. Right. Slips, strips and falls. The obvious there might be nasty old food or bacteria growing. There's the obvious you, you don't have this the space to move around like you used to. Right. And then there's the underlying well, they got the dopamine trip because it's like, yeah, that that sock drawer that was, uh, you know, that wasn't cleaned out is now cleaned out. You feel good about that. You can go to your closet and feel good. Hell, I cleaned up my garage two weeks ago, um, two weekends ago. I, I, I had nothing to do on the weekend, so of course I got a bunch of stuff done because nothing I had to do. It's all the things I got to do. And my daughter came home um, this weekend. Um, she lives in Indianapolis primarily. She came home this week, and uh, one of the first things is, hey, Penny, look, the garage is cleaned out. I was proud as a dad. To say, you know what? The garage is cleaned out. It wasn't, and now it is. Um, and of course, her being 10, she's like, I don't know, it looks the same. It's like, to her, it didn't even, she's like, I don't know, she got her bikes, her Vespa, her, all the things she needs were, you know, where she needed them to be. And yet, like, I felt good doing it. I felt good every time I drive in my garage. And then I felt great telling my daughter, hey, look, you know, your dad, your dad did something, you know, good, worthy of, you know, being your father. Um so I love that. I love that. We do we do the immediate good that has a long-term good effect. Um, because, yeah, otherwise, junk, trash, refuge, MSW, garbage, whatever you want to call it, there's a negative connotation. And yet we're, what we're doing is we're doing good. We're creating wealth in those spaces and places. Hmm. Wealth and health. You know, the, the health benefit wealth is, is very real. Very real. Very real. We are 18 minutes episode, 18 minutes into this episode. I think we have a title, The Wealth and Health of the Junk Removal, The Impact. Wealth and Health, there The Impact go. that we have in Junk Removal. There we go. Look at that. You know, we have a hard, I know you have a hard stop right at uh, 6 p.m. Eastern, 7, you know, 5 o'clock, 5 p.m. here. So we'll go a hard stop. I mean, we already, we already got our nugget, right? We're, we're 18 minutes into it. We're very efficient. <laughs> efficient. All right. So tell me about your team. How big is your team? How many trucks you're running? How many guys you got? What's your org chart look like? Sure. Um, sure. So I keep everything as lean as, as possible here. Yeah. Um, during the summer, we run about uh, uh, four to five trucks. Um, uh, during the winter, we drop down about two or three uh, yep. when, when things start getting a little bit slower. Um, so, uh, you know, and, and our team members can range anywhere between nine to 25. Um, it might sound like oh, a wow. lot for five trucks, uh, yeah, it sounds like a but lot. we have a really flexible environment here for our team members. Um, uh, when I manage my team, I don't, uh, if, if any team member for whatever reason needs off, now that they do have to let me know that they want off before they the schedule comes out, um, but we yep. just don't say no. It's like we're all adults here, but if I can't cover those shifts, I'm going to get other people. Uh, so, uh, my core members stay pretty solid, but it's my summer guys, my summer guys, mm -hmm. they like taking vacations with their families. They like taking off. Um, so I have to kind of over hire on that. Granted, a lot of them only have to work two or three days, uh, but they tend to be really happy with that. And it keeps us fully staffed during the summer. Uh, I'm yeah. not trying to force a bunch of, you know, um, people getting out of high school, you know, trying to have fun and partying and whatever they're doing uh, uh, during their summer. I'm not trying to cramp that, uh, but I do need my shifts covered. Uh, yeah. So the 25 is pretty extreme. That's only happened once. Um, it normally goes up 
uh, I probably say about like 15 or 20. Um, but yeah. if I don't get my shifts covered, I just keep hiring until they're all covered. No, I, I love that. And that's the other thing is, you know, you, the hillbilly math says you did a million top line service revenue on an average of three and a, three to four trucks, right? If we average it out throughout the year, which is right, right? A, a, a company can do about 250 to 350 a truck Correct. depending on, I mean, can you do 400 a truck? Yeah, you can have two trucks screaming ass 400, right? And, and they don't like, and they're running six days a week or whatever, right? But it's like the average is if you're doing less than 200 a truck, like you're, you're, you're paying for an asset that's not working, right? So if you have five, five physical trucks. Yeah. So you always have one sitting like th not the end of the world. So I like that too. And that's, that's a good ratio. What's interesting with you is I typically say with what I like, what you said at the top, I run things lean. The challenge is the guy that get to that five, that four to 600. So average around 500 with two trucks, then they want to make the big jump. And somewhere between like 750 and 1.25 is when they die because they don't put enough infrastructure in to go from the one 0.25 to 1.5 when you can have a little bit of you can have a couple uh other um people on your leadership team so how does that work now are you what else, what do you have other than truck guys do you have an operations manager answering the phone or you know what do you have or are you the whole business beyond that sure um so i outsource uh a lot of that work um i have a va that helps me um, but yes, uh, when you get up to that 1.25 and things start to change, so, uh, you exit, um, which is if you've ever heard of the Adizis life cycle, um, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, look it up. It's very interesting. Um, but, uh, you know, you're in a go-go corporation, which means, you know, you gotta go, you gotta go full throttle. Um, you know, I'm very rarely out in the trucks. If I'm in the trucks, it's because that it's either, uh, an emergency that something yep. happened or um, there's just something outside the expertise of my team and we all need to get together. Um, yeah. But pretty much, uh, you know, my management team, everything, you know, we're all out in the trucks. We're doing what we need to do. Um, I have some marketing teams uh, that helps me uh, run the business. Um, but, but yeah, that, that 1.25, you know, you start getting growing pains. And yep. if you do have a manager out there too, um, understand that the people who got you here aren't necessarily going to get you there. Uh, and and I I unfortunately had that experience as well. Um, so we're yep. ultra lean right now. We're a little bit more leaner than I would like. <laughs> uh, I like I like that but, word. Uh, leaner, leaner is yeah. a good word. Struggle bus yeah. with the right people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it, exactly. But you know, uh, you know, keeping. Uh, really good track on making sure that the metrics, you know, you know what your numbers are, uh, yep. how much money you're bringing in, the percentage that is going out for your dumps, your fuel, uh, your labor are really important. And if you can get those, then if anything what, starts your, going wrong, what, your, what, is, what, what, what are your cogs? So this is, this is something I've heard. Do you, do you know what your cogs are as a, as a percentage? I do. I do. Are you um, share that or not? <laughs> no, no, I'll, I'll, I'll share them. Uh, my I got, because, because what's his face? Uh, fucking happy junk removal. Joe, John, what's that guy's John Aguirre yeah. down in. Yeah. He's John's like, a buddy he runs it. Too. Okay. He runs at like 22%. Right. And I also know guys that are like, we want to keep it under 40. Right. So that's like the, yeah. It, okay. John's fucking like, I mean, he talk about running lean and tight. He's a two truck machine. You know, like he runs his two trucks tight. Um, and I know what our number is because I'm a numbers guy. So I, that's that's the thing. I want to know what that number is because uh, last week on the show when I talked to Barton, when we talked about scaling, what I consider to be a sweet spot is 25% EBITDA, right? Whatever that is for you, when you can have bottom line 25% EBITDA, that's the sweet spot. Because I had a year I did 1.5 at a 28.5% EBITDA. Now, that was my last year of doing the franchise. And then we transitioned brands and da-da-da. And then I also know getting from one to two, fucking – sucked up cash right it's and i brutal. so yeah. it's brutal right and and we were too we were not smart enough when we went from 380 to one we went from 380 to nine year over year we didn't i don't know what goddamn cogs were i'm like i don't know just fucking more let's go more let's go more let's go more right um and actually the worst year we had was from 900 to a million because we acted like a 1.5 million dollar business and when they got to a million and so that that one sucked a lot of cash too. So we went we went 380, 900, 
one and then 1.5. And that's where we saw, right? So that, that 901, that's when we made the investments to get to 1.5. So that the year we did one was like a, oh shit. I mean, where, where'd all our money go? And then, and then I have trucks sitting out in the lot because it's like, oh, we bought all these fucking trucks. And yeah, in January, they're sitting here. So yeah, anyway. yeah. Uh, we got knocked down a peg when we hit about 1.1 1. 1, uh, yeah. our, our ourselves. And, and it's the same thing. Uh, you know, and, and there's a real cost too. There is a cost. Um, uh, so, so for our cogs, and cogs can be s different between different organizations depending on what you're actually so I, measuring. So the only three things I want to know is uh, direct labor, disposal, fuel. So that's a, that's like the generally accepted. We can go and travel some other shit, but those three. Do you know what that number is? Is a percentage of overall revenue. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so our for for direct labor, we also carry workers' compensation on it because you, oh, you put it in there. Okay, yeah, is a yeah. direct cost. Uh, uh, same thing with with taxes. Uh, so, um, as far as us, we like to to get the more global, like what is truly variable. Uh, yep. So, for all those who don't know out there, um, uh, cost of services sold is through. Through direct operations, there's no fluff in it. It is if you turn on that truck, what costs are associated with all of the activity that you do to promote? And uh, those of you guys who are out there and paying yourselves a salary and you're jumping out in that truck, make sure your accounting for yourself is exactly what you would pay for a driver. If not, your your numbers are trash. You do not know what you're actually producing. You're not you think you're profitable, but you're working yourself to bankruptcy if you replace yourself. Um, and, and, and you, if you really, really want to, and, and, and now, now now after you do that math, now figure out what your business does in a year and give yourself half of that as a salary, right? Because that's what you're working the business hourly rate. So, for example, if your if your business does a uh, million dollars a year, right? You're worth five hundred dollars an hour all day to your business. So now pay yourself the 15, 17, 20, whatever it is, and then put on the opportunity costs. It's like, well, I only jumped on the truck for five hours. Cool. That cost your business twenty five hundred dollars that week. Like that's the next level. You're like, oh shit. You're like, yeah. The, the hillbilly, hillbilly math is right somewhere between what your top line revenue is you're worth between a quarter and a half of what that number is per hour that's your billable rate so if you do a million you are worth 250 to 500 dollars an hour billable right cuz you can only work in the business so many hours before there's a natural attrition of right what you're actually doing so anyway that's that's next level math i love that though of the it's like yeah i there's people out there. We all know who the fuck they are on the books, on the groups. It's like, I answer every fucking phone call. I fucking, I'm on every job. I fucking bang every job. And I made $200,000 this year. It's like, great. I made $200,000 this year and I wear flip-flops most days or whatever the number is, right? Because I scaled the business accordingly, you know, if that's whatever you're, that's why I never talk about my take home because it's so insignificant, right? It's It's more of a percentage of how we're growing as a business and what does that look like? So anyways, and I love the fact you, it, and this is, a, this is the argument I had last month, which is, um, cause we have our end of day reports is I took workers comp out of the calculation for end of day because the way we attribute it to it. And, and honestly, it's like one phone call to my bookkeeper to be like, Hey, you know what? Take the workers comp out of the insurance and put it into the, the, the cogs insurance. Cause you're right. My GL doesn't, my GL is my GL. However, that workers comp that's, that number sucks looking at every month too, because it's so fucking high. Yeah, yeah, it, all of it is because you know we're lifting stuff up. You know, I had an I employee know. one time; uh, he snipped off um, uh, the the forward part of his finger, mm. um, and he was a newer guy. And uh, granted, it, it, it what they said it would grow back, um, but he was out for two months. And if I didn't have workers' comp to pay for all that, uh, which uh, workers' comp they keep down the prices too when it comes down to expenses, like they know what the the, the the game is out there and uh they took oh, care yeah. of him he was happy with it but uh you know it's a very real cost because it's a very real risk out there so whoever is out there too uh, uh you know talking about like cogs and, and making sure that we're uh that we're being you know attributing our our sales correctly is you know one of the first things that people have to do is get that assistant you know uh, if you're answering your phone calls you need to stop that's the first thing you need to unload the first thing um and uh 
you know, I, I can't overstate too. Um, it's really easy to get a, uh, you know, put yourself, uh, put your stuff in some so sort of call measuring system. Uh, put on that nice, you know, you call us up and says, hey, thanks for calling Spartan Junk Removal. Please hold while we find uh, or while we connect you with a live person. Just that's yeah. going to cut out like over 60% of your uh, telemarketing Bullshit. calls. Because oh, yeah. they're just not be able to connect, you know. Um, those are the calls that are only going to be on there 15 to 30 seconds. So you're going to save yourself headache. You'll hmm. remove stuff off your plate. And then uh, as a business owner, too, you'll be a lot healthier not answering every damn phone call that comes through your business. Believe me, you know, we have a lot of stuff that we have to look out for, making sure our teams are happy, making sure that our customers are happy, making sure that logistics makes sense, uh, especially when you start hiring out. People start going to random places. It doesn't make sense. They just don't have the experience. So we have to kind of be the eagle eye in the sky. Uh, and, and you can't do that if you're answering and chasing down every phone call um, and telemarketer that exists. Yeah, there's that. Yeah, that the, there's a the busy badge. I, I people want to give themselves as a business owner. It's like, wow. So the so do you own the business or the business own you? And it's like a cheese dick way of saying it. And yet it's true. I remember um, maybe my, within my first year of business, people were like, what does success look like? I go sleeping in on a Saturday, right? So I got that operations person that could answer the phone and answer it on Saturday mornings. Like the first Saturday when I slept in past eight a.m. was like, oh my god. I made it. I made it as a business owner. Now I go on vacation for a week and I can be out of the country and I come back and like, all right, what's going on? You know, because I was willing to not answer the phone that first Saturday in order to, and also keep my business. Well, that means I have to hire somebody else to do the thing um, to make that happen. And even now as we scale, right. Well, even million, 2 million, you know, Barton's North of 2 million. There are still things that I do daily. that are not worth, $500 an hour or $1,000 an hour. I know there aren't. Uh, earlier today, there was a text message of one of our employees who he was bitching. He was told he, he was told to talk to this person, gave him an answer. He didn't like the answer. So then he hit hit up our assistant because she does payroll because it was a payroll thing. And he was misinformed on how per diem works, whatever. So mm -hmm. anyways, the screenshot was scared, shared into a group text with me. So of course, I'm losing my fucking mind. I'm like, this motherfucker. Right. So then I said, Hey, start a new group text message that doesn't include me. This is not a good use of my time or my energy. And I, and I struggle, I struggle to have the discipline not to light this motherfucker up. Right. So, because you want to know, because per diem, right? His, 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 his bitch was he's out on a job. It's like an hour and a half away. So we're like, Hey, you're going to get $50 per diem both days you're there. Right. So you can, well, he didn't get his per diem first thing in the morning because the per diem money is out on the job. So, like, well, how am I supposed mm. to eat breakfast? I'm like, uh, before work. That's how you're supposed to eat breakfast. So at, at 9.49 this morning, he's like, this is bullshit. I didn't get my per diem. It's like, from the time you got to work till now, it's not even your fucking lunch yet. So what did it matter if you had $50 in your pocket? So now I'm rehashing something. Not a good use of my time. This is not, <laughs> this is not 10x thinking. Um, because I get sucked into that shit, you know? Because... Because I do. <laughs> so it's like going to Target. If I go to Target, I'm, I'm going to spend $100 like every other fucking suburban chick. So what do I do? I keep my ass out of Target. So same thing here. I limit the amount of information I get. So whether it's phone calls, emails, text messages. I used to check the, 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 the company email all weekend. Not a good use of my time. That's not a way of being no. fresh in the morning. It, it and, you know, a lot of these employees that we have, too, um, you know, a lot of employees come in uh, not very experienced, you know, that, you know, my, my wife, she works for um, a, she's a government subcontractor and yet she gets per diem uh, whenever she travels and stuff like that. But she's sitting on that stuff sometimes for a month before she gets reimbursed for it. Uh, and, and, and that's very yeah. real. And a lot of these guys, you know, that they just don't understand it. They think that everything is it's instantaneous. And it's like, no, it has to be processed through your paycheck. And uh, employees need to know too, like we are respond, like we have to have a paper trail. This isn't something that's imaginary or coming up. Only there is one government agency that I think everybody is afraid of or should be mm -hmm. afraid of that's the irs three letters yep. they're the ones that can touch you anywhere and everywhere they can even reach their hands across uh 
uh, national borders. Um, I hear stories all the time about people trying to tax evade. And the United States is one of the few countries that tax all earnings, even overseas, and they'll they will reach out and touch you, one hundred percent. But yeah, that's uh, th- th- that that's my two bits on that is making sure that these guys know, like, hey, um, you know, these are the rules. I don't make them, but I have to follow them just like you do. The challenge is the other companies near us, moving companies, junk removal, and whatnot, that don't play by the rules, right? We get guys all the time. It's like, oh, this guy pays me cash. You know, it's like, well, that's not right. It's like, well, he does. I'm like, well, that's not right. Or we get a lot of guys that are like, oh, yeah, I drove for the last company. I'm like, you don't have a valid driver's license. We're like, yeah, but he let me drive. Okay. <laughs> Still holds true, right? So, like, we get that. It's like your point of educating. I'd rather take an 18, 19-year-old with no work experience than a 22, 23-year-old that, you know, came from shitty companies that paid cash that let them drive that, you know, and it's like, fuck, you know, and that's, that's one of the challenges are in our industry. A lot of other industries aren't like that. You go work retail, everything's legit. you go work manufacturing in a facility. Everything's legit, right? You get your PPE, all this other stuff. The challenge is in junk removal and moving. The nature of it is you got plenty of truck on a truck out there that'll pay guys cash for day labor. And then hell, there is a, um, one of the um, temp agencies here, in the Midwest, that's here in Milwaukee. It's called Labor Ready. They pay those guys cash day of, like cash. They basically mm-hmm. hand them a check. The guy walks over to the counter and turns his check in and gets cash day of. So they got the paper trail, right? And they act as the bank. And of course, then they, then they also take like 3% right off the bat. So it's like, but they got paid cash day of. So it's like, these guys are like, well, I was told I was getting cash today. It's like, who told you that? Well, you said I was getting paid. Well, yeah, you're getting paid. We process payroll every other Friday. You know, we have some guys that are like, I don't know how to use direct deposit. You can't work here then. Like, that's a minimum threshold. I got sick of going. Get, I, I got sick of Friday come and the, the the hard checks didn't arrive from ADP in time, right? Because that mm-hmm. shit happens, right? Or I'd be running to the bank to get a cashier's check so they could deposit it right away. Because if I had a hand jam check, they're not going to be able to deposit it. I'm like, so it's like six months ago or four months ago, whatever it was, June. I was like, nope, we're not doing this. We're like, effective July 1. If you don't have your direct deposit set up, pre-employment, you don't start. And again, kind of like you said, weeding out. We weeded out a bunch of guys right off the bat. Like, I don't have a bank account. Good. You haven't done the minimum things in life to be employed here. Right? It's like, I'd rather you have a bank account than a high school diploma. Because one of those things actually matter. And that's the threshold we have sometimes with these jokers. Hey, you know, um, speaking of of uh high school diplomas um one thing we do here is if somebody doesn't have their high school diploma is we'll actually pay for their tests in order for them to get their high school diploma um because we do have plenty of guys that come in and 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 they just don't have that that skill set um but yeah uh i agree with you the bare minimum you have to have is a uh is a bank account for direct deposit or some sort of card or something like that. I mean, gosh, you can get it from Venmo, Cash App. Um, you can get direct deposit yeah. straight into the apps, and it's like you can absolutely do that. I, I, we, we, we had one guy that was on Chime, and it was a total pain in the ass. So we, we even stopped doing that. But yeah, some of them like Venmo. We're like, you just need our bank account. I don't care how you access the money. I have to. I need a routing number. I'm not gonna play. Yes, I don't care if it's one of those online banks. I think it was Chime. The guy's like, oh, my money's no like not available. I'm like that's not my problem. Like the money's out of my account. I sent it to where you wanted me to send it to. That's a them problem. Um, and then I was like, whatever. It kept happening. I'm like, I, I don't know how much I believe this guy versus this guy's just broke. Always wanted advances. Um, and then when it turns out, he by the time he quit, he had owed us like eight hundred dollars in advances. Um, and and we just basically garnished his last check, and he was pissed. And yeah. Like, we had one employee and I found this afterwards and uh, they kept overdrafting their account because there was some sort of bank glitch. And then uh, the employee came up to me like, don't send my deposit to my bank. And I'm like, I can't help that. Like it's, it's already out of my account. And they were really peed off at me, but um, uh, granted that employee ended up uh, parting ways um, just cause they couldn't handle their stuff. But I found out later from another employee, like what happened. It's like, well, they essentially committed, uh, bank fraud and they just kept hitting the account over and over and over and over drafted it like a couple thousand dollars and i was like yeah that's not my fault <laughs> well, yeah we we also got guys that are pissed because they're like oh don't you know 
I'm on 1099. Don't don't W two me. It's like, well, I have to W two me. It's like, oh, they're gonna take out my garnishments. It's like, oh, you owe the state a bunch of money from child support or from fucking tickets or some. Not my problem. I paid you the agreed upon dollars per hour. The state gets involved. Like we had one guy, he was a 1099, and then we went to W two. Was like, hey, if you want to drive our trucks, it was 1099 for a couple of weeks, kind of a right, fractional guy. And we're like, hey, in order for you to be full time, you have to be W two. He's like, what do you mean I got to pay taxes? I'm like, yeah, it's a W-9. You have to fill this out. He's like, well, oh, I don't pay taxes. I'm like, well, that that's that's a problem. Like, I want to be a 1099 guy. So every time there's a conflict like that, it is garnishments. It's disability. It, and I'll, I'll tell guys, I don't care. If you're not able to be a two, W-2, you don't want to be a W-2, then don't work here. It's like, well, I want the job. I want the money. It's like, well, there's also the responsibility of paying the IRS. Um, and it's interesting. Like, you know, now we're just we're two couple business owners, you know, bitching and yet like on the podcast like those are th- but those are things that I look out for when people are bitching about their paycheck there's something else going on it's not the paycheck right there mm-hmm. is something else going on they're not handling their business or the guys that can't get a lot of guys like i've taken guys up like, we will go over to chase bank right now with a driver's license you can have a you can have a checking account in 10 minutes 15 whatever it is it is not difficult so when guys are completely mm-hmm. averse to that i'm like you know what i don't know what's going on here and i don't care like it's it's 2024. If you can't do direct deposit, you can't work here. I'm I'm gonna uh, jump in on that too, and this is for all you business owners out there, um, whoever you have your bank with. Always, always, always call up your bank and ask them what extras that they cannot honestly give the officers of the business but also ask for what they can give the employees of the business. So a lot of people don't realize that, but when you go to a bank, they do have extras and they do have comps and you can ask them for their employees and your employees really appreciate that too. And that's a benefit that you can provide. Say that again. What do you mean by extras? Uh, Ask them for extras. Uh, Sometimes they can give free bank accounts if they were paid bank accounts before. Um, easier access to loans because the direct deposit comes directly from the business. Chase to chase. The employee. Yeah, you can ask them. Um, sometimes it can be just like free checks or something like that. Uh, oh. Because the bank banks are really incentivized. And, and we can go on to getting lending as well for yourself and your employees. It makes it easier because the money is circulating in the same financial institution. Mm. Um, so not only do you get better perks, your employees can get better perks just for the fact of you having a business there. Uh, so if nobody has ever done that, go to your bank, call them up tomorrow. Cause today is absolutely a uh, bank holiday. Um, I've been irritated with that all morning. Uh, but, uh, Why is but that give, bank holiday? Oh, got it. About the extra oh, perks. Columbus Day. Oh, there. My yeah. producer yelled Columbus Day. It's not Columbus Day. It's Indigenous People Day. Whatever. I didn't. Even, there you go. You know what? It's fucking Monday. Also, uh, I emailed somebody else. They're like, "Oh, it's Canada Day." And I was like, "That ain't a fucking thing." So yeah, she's like, "It's Canada oh, Day." So, yeah. <laughs> also, because I was actually last week, I was on a call. Three of my favorite people are Canadian. Three like three people I interact with. So Jobber, uh, go get you some Jobber. Get Jobber.com. No big deal. Plug. Uh, nice job. Another plug. Use fucking love. Fucking nice job. I'm gonna make Taylor do some work here. Uh, and then five hundred five drunk removal. My buddy Barry. Actually, I've never really promoted that. My buddy Barry, 505 Junk Removal, joined his mastermind about six weeks ago. Huge fan. Huge fan of mastermind. I do very limited consulting these days. I have one consulting client um, I picked up last week. I even tell people on the podcast, I don't do consulting. You have to have a very unique situation for me to get uh, excited about consulting for you. Um, typically, you got to be in business over five years and be fucked. Like you, I, like I want, like the more fucked you are, the higher likely, because I get the guys who are like, Hey, I'm in my third year of business and I want to know how to get somewhere. I'm like, call me in a couple of years when you're all fucked. Like I want something to chew on. I want, I want to consult to a point where I can learn more. Right. So I got a client I'm bringing on who's uh, been in business over 15 years and wants to get out in five years. So it's like, okay, that's like that. That's a low okay, That's fucking interesting. Exactly. Right. And, and, and we got 15 plus years of data to work with. Like that's fucking interesting. Versus, I've been in business two or three years. Like there's not, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot to chew on. I'll give you thirty minutes of my time. That's what I'll give you. So there's the plug. You've been in business, I'll say at least five years, and you, you are fucked. Then you can call me for consulting because also when you're when you're when you're in a shit spot, you're willing to pay because you know the pain of it. 
I tell other people I charge between 250 and 500 an hour for consulting. And you get someone that's, you know, got a, two nickels to their name. Like th th that's an insane amount of money. You ask me my first year, 250 to 500 hours an hour for consulting. I tell you, you're fucking nuts. Right <laughs> now, now I'm like, yeah, teach me something for 250 bucks, whatever it is, you know, like, um, anyway, so 505 uh, junk uh, removal that I was getting to, I was getting somewhere there. 505 junk removal mastermind meets weekly. I get beyond value out of that. Can love Barry and what we're doing over there because the power's in the mastermind. I've never been in an industry mastermind. I've avoided everybody else's up until this point. I, I fuck with Barry's. That's it. We're in it. I, I we committed to six months, and every week I I leave with like two or three takeaways. So there's the plug for Barry and his team. I, I've spoken with Barry a couple times. He's a He's great good. guy. He's and fucking good shit. And, and it's crazy because you can definitely tell somebody who's been through the ringer and who has like the real hard oh experience of being a business owner, because yeah. when you actually commit to a business, you know, up or down, you've got to march through because there is no other way beyond it because you're, you have so many strings bound around you uh, yep. that, you know, even when all hope is lost and, and, you know, you're marching in the dark, you still got to move forward. And um, I, I, as a matter of fact, Barry uh, invited me out to his mastermind. Um, I have a couple things going on right now, so I didn't join it. But he's like, you got to get in this thing. And he's like, uh, Chris, what the fuck? <laughs> I'll spend the next no, I, I'm in it. I'm in it. Uh, I'll also shout out, uh, uh, whatever, Taylor over up, up and away. He's in the mastermind. He's good people. He's come up here to Wisconsin to visit me. I met him Wonderful. a couple years ago. He's been on the podcast twice. Yeah, like smart people. Um Smart people in that mastermind. I highly, especially when you're in that one, maybe you don't want to get to two. Maybe you want to stay at one. You want to be tighter. There's still things you can do to get tighter or get to one and figure out how to work less and, and make more, whatever. Uh, I high, yeah, highly recommend it. So it, um, it, he's doing better than 1 800 got junk in their original, in, his in their, in their own, in their, the oh, the, he's going head to head with 800 pound gorilla and winning. Um, no, huge fan of Barry. If you want to know more without Barry selling you, and Barry's not a sales guy. Like, Barry's like no. me. It's like, hey, he, like, we got on the phone. It was like an hour and a half. We just jammed. And it was after the podcast. So I'm like, all right. Well, these guys saying all the right things. Um, you want to know more about 505 Junk Removal Mastermind? He's even, re are you re oh, Bolt. There it is. Bolt Academy, I think it's called. Yeah. Yeah, um, Academy, yep. There you go. See, like, yeah, this is how much I I'm just like, Barry's good shit. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, uh, if you want to know, here, I'll do my, here, I, I was in radio. If you want to know more about Bolt Academy with our good friend from 505 Junk Removal, Barry, the leader in the industry, give me a call. Andy Wines at Camel Crew, Responsible Junk Removal, and I'll let you know the tips, tricks, and tactics to grow your junk removal dream here on the Trash Talk Business Podcast. Here we go. There was a little 15-second uh, yeah, you know, little, yeah. little stank. Well, hey, how are you? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to message him after that and uh, uh, tell yeah, him. Yeah, hit him up. <laughs> Tell, tell him we're tell plugging him up. <laughs> go on down to the Bold Academy. Tell him Andy sent you. Yeah. Hell, I, you yeah. know, I fumbled and bumbled talking about the recycling summit. I was like, oh, yeah, I got to mention this. Because Taylor's like, don't forget it. Because last week I mentioned it like a, an hour and one minute into the show. Oh, yeah, by the way, I'm doing this thing. There we go. So I mentioned <laughs> it at the 14 minute mark. Uh, hold on. The whole reason I was talking about that, the whole reason I even brought up Barry was uh, Canada Day, right? And I was giving them shit because like July 1st is their not even Independence Day. They don't get a fucking they don't get a fucking Independence Day in July because they didn't win. They just like told England to fuck off, like respectfully and politely. They didn't have to fucking fight a war over it. They're they're one of the few Commonwealth nations that didn't do anything. They're just like, hey, uh, can we just like be sovereign now? And the British are like, Yeah, I guess you're like a hundred times the size of us and polite. So anyways, I gave him shit. Like, we earned our fucking Independence Day. No big deal. Fucking USA, <laughs> number one. Back-to-back -back World War champs. Um, Total tangent. Now I am thinking, now, now going back to what we were talking earlier, about going to my banker and be like, hey, help a brother out. Oh, that's what I was going to say. Years ago, this was like five years ago, I remember I was sitting there. It was like the last, last week of December, early January, and I needed a line of credit. Like, we were in a tough spot financially. And I went to my computer. It was at my old house, remember? I, I went to my computer, and it was like, get approved for up to $120,000 instantly, line of credit, Chase Bank. And they're like, all you have to do is like hit a button. So I was like, fuck it. I was like, in my boxers, I hit the button. I'm like, fuck it. Made a cup of coffee, came back to my desk. And I'm like, I don't know how we're going to survive the winter. My business is fucked. 
I'm going to have to go get a job. I'm going to start driving Uber. Like, just the whole thing. By the time I made a cup of coffee and came back, they're like, you're approved for $90,000. I was like, what the? Huh? But it, because it was all about cash flows. They saw, they knew exactly how much money I put in my account revolving because it was within the Chase platform. And they're like, yep, here's what, like they said, like, here's what you can afford. Right, you could afford whatever it was nine or ninety or whatever it was, and they're like, "I asked for 60. It was like, "Fuck it, take the whole ninety. And I'm glad I did because the one thing I did learn years ago um, for my CEO roundtable was get lines of credit, get money available before you need it, because once you need it, now it's already like go get a line of credit when you have a high AR. Go get a line of credit when you have a healthy profit and loss statement. Get approved, even if you get approved to a hundred. Let's say you get approved for a hundred. Right. And then later, they're like, hey, send us some financial docs. They're like, okay, actually, we're going to take you from 100 down to 50. Cool. Now you got 50 to work with. If you wait till you need 50 and go asking for 50 and you're not pre approved, you never did the work, you didn't show fucking intent, good luck. It's because yeah. even, uh, even uh, you're going to take 30 days to fund right. it. Yeah. Everybody should be applying for loans in the busy season when you're. Yes. You're, like, yes. like this is the late. Like, like if you want a line of credit for the winter, apply for it now at the latest. Like now is good. You have to do it now. You have yeah. to. Have to. And because by Thanksgiving. And, not no, chance. no. And the good thing is too, um, you know, especially, you know, managing cash flow with these trucks is very real because, you know, mm. anything can happen. You know, one time we got a, uh, some chicken wire sucked up in our rear differential and popped that pumpkin. Uh, that's I didn't even knew it was uh, called a pumpkin until that I, thing shattered the glass. Uh, <laughs> and it cost us 12 grand in order to replace oh. everything that it destroyed. So you never know when these trucks, uh, uh, we haven't had it happen since because we learn like you back up, you see anything, you don't run over that thing regardless of what the people at the landfill tell you to do. They're not the one paying the 12 grand to fix the truck, you know? Actually, better um, yet, it, we, start, we started going to transfer stations like a year and a half ago instead of landfills. Yeah. The amount of tires I don't – like, I, I don't care what the differential is. The amount of tires I'm not replacing is substantial. Huge. huge. Yeah. And in and, and the 12 grand, too, um, it's not just the cost of the pumpkin. It's nope. downtime in the truck. It's what did you have to do behind it? How much business are you losing? And this was really early on when, when we were operating – so always, always, always apply for the loans when you need it during the summer. And, and, and I'll you tell you what. Before you need it. Apply for the loans yeah. when you don't need it. Yeah. And, and if you're just starting out too, um, ask your banker, why? Why am I not approved? What would you like to see? They'll get really nervous and just say, listen, man, just I want to know, like, what does the bank prefer? Create that relationship. And if not, especially if you're at like that one truck level, um, there is the SBA out there. They'll give you a yep. lot more, but I'll tell you what, if you ever do take out a loan, make sure A, it's for something that you need and B, it's going to produce you money. Don't be just taking out loans to purchase yourself a TV or mix in your money. Mm. That's a really good way for anybody to touch you out there because uh, your business finances have to be separate. Do not yep. take anything. And if you do, make sure you categorize it as, hey, this is owner's withdrawal. You know, yep. uh, I had a, you know, it could be your personal car or something like yeah, that. You had, you had, you had you yourself. Yeah. Yourself yeah. And, and then you take it out and your bankers are really happy with it. And then if something ever does happen with your business, like let's say something catches on fire and all your trucks burn up, you know, you can't, per, you know, you can't predict that. And those things happen sometimes. Uh, but it, 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 if that ends up happening, uh, make sure that, that, um, that your other people that you have credit with can't touch you. And the only way yep. to do that is make sure that you're running your business above board. Don't be paying people with cash. Don't be intermingling your money whatsoever. Business bank account is for business. Personal is for personal. And if you do need a withdraw out, make sure you cut yourself a check, deposit in your personal, and then you're A-OK -okay with the government. You're OK with yep. lenders and uh, you're, you're protecting yourself overall. No, I love that. Um... We'll get to the big finish here with respect to your time. Uh, I, I love that because I, to me, I was like, well, of course, why wouldn't people do that? And then I see so many horses. So I grew up 30 years watching my parents run a business, right? So I, I already, like, I learned that. I, I knew that day one. I'm like, that's a personal thing. No, we have personal bank accounts. We have business bank accounts. Why would we intermingle those? And then I meet people that are like, oh, yeah, I don't have an EIM. It's like, well, how long have you been in business? It's like, oh, oh, I have a Venmo account. People pay me on my personal Venmo. I'm like, oh. 
like a business Venmo is not difficult to do. I did it in like 10 minutes and like, ooh. Anyways, all right, let's get to it, Chris. Big te- top takeaway, top takeaway from today's conversation. What's your top takeaway? That's a question. Um, uh, you know, uh, I like that we were talking about, you know, the how good that junk removal mm. does for for our industry, both immediate and long term and making sure that, you know, uh, when we capture these employees that we give them a little bit of empathy training so so that they're there. Uh, and, and also to reiterate um, for all these guys out there, you know, money, money and cash flow is a very real thing. Make sure that you get your loans uh, on your busy season and, and get it before you need the money. If that's not a global truth, because that's with any business, I don't know what is. <laughs> No, I uh, I love those two points, um, and I, I'm gonna I'm gonna double tap what you said. Not only from an empathy training standpoint, from a sales and marketing standpoint, right? Lean into hey, what we do, right, gr- creates wealth and health for the space and the people that we interact with, right? And then my because my life's mission is to breathe life into the people, the places, and the products that we interact with. So lean in with that. Lean into the fact that what we do is we do good that lasts for a lo- long time, and that that's a different message than. I pick up stuff and I put it down. I haul shit to the landfill. I, I do junk outs of estates, right? And that's the level of the this industry, the junk removal industry that brings that level of professionalism, right? We do good that lasts in our industry. And when we do that, we're going to be talking more about recycling, more about logistics, more about the level of professionalism, less about waste and trash and refuge and who, fucking how do I price this job and who's the fucking cheapest price in town, right? When... We stand up for ourselves as an industry. We all will be recognized as more professional. We'll all be able to charge more for our services and get the recognition that we that we have earned because we treat this industry as such. So I really appreciate that, Chris. Thank you again for coming. Um, I, I shit you not. This was like noon. We had our, our guest reschedule. And at first I'm like, all right, I guess we're not doing the show this week. Uh, thank you to Taylor, our producer. He put up a post on LinkedIn or Facebook or something. And, and Barton and then Chris, and then here we are. So uh, you want to be a guest on the Trash Talk Business Podcast? We are booking into November. Uh, we also, uh, thinking about it, talking about it, in two weeks from today, we are transitioning from Mondays to Tuesdays. So starting October 29th, we're going to be having the show live every Tuesday. The release schedule, uh, otherwise, will change, stay the same. For people that listen after it's live, will remain the same. So you want to be a guest on the Trash Talk Business Podcast any Tuesday starting in November 4 p.m., not Thanksgiving, because we're going to watch the Green Bay Packers take on the uh, Dolphins. See, Casey's not here anymore, and one of the chief complaints we used to get is we talked about football too much this time of year. Uh, anybody that watched, though, the Cowboys not looking great yesterday. I turned the game off about the first half, and the Lions, mwah, even though I hate the Lions, I, 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 I wanted the Cowboys to win. Lions look way good, way good. And the Green Bay football Packers, no big deal, got the W at Lambeau per usual. There's your football update for all the, the football haters out there. <laughs> Anyhow, uh, with respect to time, look at this. We are getting done on time this week. Got a great nuggets. Chris, I'm really happy I got the opportunity uh, to meet you, learn from you, listen to you, um, and I uh, want to continue building this relationship as we build this industry together. So thank you again for uh, joining us last minute. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. This has been really enjoyable. Uh, I loved meeting you. Uh, yeah. And yeah, uh, look forward to replaying this to my kids too. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I like it. All right. On behalf of Taylor, our producer, Chris, we're our guest. I'm Andy Wines. This has been another amazing episode of the Trash Talk Business Podcast, and we will see you next week. Thanks for listening. Tap subscribe or follow to get the latest episode. And if you enjoyed this episode, be sure to leave us a review and tell a friend to listen. To learn more, visit TrashTalkBusinessPodcast.com. Bye now.